Taking a critical look at the gaming news of the week. This is Augmented Reality, presented by the Triple S League. Hey everybody, welcome to the Augmented Reality Podcast for February 15th, 2020. Happy belated Valentine's Day to all of you out there. Uh, it's actually, today is my Valentine's Day. Today is when uh, my wife and I are, are uh, going out and doing things because the restaurants will not be crowded and the flowers will probably be uh, a tenth of the price they were yesterday. So uh, that'll be fun. Anyway, hope you all had a great day yesterday, whether you are with somebody or whether you are on your own. Um, if, if you are not currently with somebody, CD Projekt Red has you covered. We'll get into that in a second. Uh, but uh, welcome to the show today. This is your source for news, leaks, and insights about games in the gaming industry. We'll be going into Tim Sweeney's talk at the Dice Summit uh, that happened recently, and uh, the really bizarre reporting that followed from uh, IGN. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, a couple a couple other interesting things. There's been some some neat looking games that were pointed out to us by our community. Some upcoming games, and. Uh, your questions and comments in the live chat as well so uh definitely drop your questions and comments there there's quite a few people talking there already welcome we uh we appreciate seeing that if you are listening live uh yeah and just drop a hello there today as or, or as well if you uh if you happen to be uh, listening live and don't forget to slam that like button. It likes it rough, and it tells us and YouTube that you appreciate this content. If you're listening after the fact, please drop a comment below. Tell us what you think throughout the show today. And if you're listening on one of the audio-only platforms, we're glad you're here as well. We appreciate the likes and follows. Uh, but don't forget, if you want to get the latest info sooner, we encourage you to hit the link in the description to subscribe to the Triple S League YouTube channel, where you'll find all kinds of other content in addition to the podcast. That other voice you hear is Cybsidian, as always. How are you doing, sir? Good. <clears throat> um, it's been a um, an interesting week. How so? Um, just some odd stuff going on. So, and the weather's been weird too. So, huh. you know, all right. One day it's like plus. Next day is like snow. Then it's plus. Then it's snow. Then it, it's it's weird. All right. Yeah. So. Of course, yesterday was Valentine's Day, and as usual, CD Projekt Red uh, gave us some interesting Valentine's art, which you'll see on the uh, on the image that just appeared on the screen if you're watching on YouTube, and on the uh, it's on the thumbnail today. You can see the full animated version of this on their Twitter account at Cyberpunk Game, and they say, you know, are you alone on Valentine's Day? Solo is always an option. I wonder what she's doing with that uh, that VR looking headset thing she's got on clearly she's playing the witcher 3 that's my theory mm -hmm. that's my theory so Cy, this is uh i mean it's always very easy to read into you know to, people are always looking for hidden messages and meanings in the things that cd project drops for us there's been some speculation you know is this what the brain dance is going to look like um in cyberpunk 2077 what do you think about that, and uh, is, or is there any other meaning that we can draw from this image? Well, as we can see, there's 11 bars of light on each eye, followed by, um, you know, it forming an actual heart symbol. And then when you zoom in on uh, the lower section of the picture, which we, we don't have here, you can see that she's sucking on a lollipop. There's a unicorn. There's a face with two X's over the eyes and a lip thingy, which looks like a droid head. And then there's another pin that says love, and then there's some other stuff that we can't really see. This clearly means what they're trying to tell us is that there's going to be, like, stuff in the game. There's going to be stuff in the game. Now, if you listen to the conspiratorial side of things, this means that we're going to have, like, 11 main side quests multiplied by the number of unicorns and hearts and lollipops <laughs> in the game. Now, so, that might be stretching it just a little bit, but this is what happens you when you don't give us enough news, CDPR. <laughs> this is what happens when we start going crazy. <laughs> Very so, yeah, true. We, we, Very yeah, true. It, 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 it might be a little bit crazy, um, or it might just be, you know, uh, th th this is kind of what some of the um, 
some of the tech that we'll see in the, the, the game looks like. Maybe right. maybe this is the headset for the um for the uh dream um sorry, um brain dance. And I mean she's not she's she's kind of a little like meddled up, but she has like she's only she got like five facial pins, so that, that, that was kind of interesting. It looks like somebody stapled her, which would hurt, I would imagine, a lot. So Yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah. come to think of it, those do look like staples. Mm-hmm. Two on her cheeks, two uh, you know, above her eyes there, and one on the chin. Wonder what that <laughs> what could that it's like her her face got stapled on. It's like they she went to the discount cyber face mm-hmm. replacement store and, and they just were like, Yeah, hold still. Tommy, get me the staple gun. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, as Ter Ter K puts there are four lights. Four lights. There, there are, are four <laughs> lights. There are four lights. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's it's one of these things where it's like, yeah, we're we're all going crazy. Um, there's no numbers in this one, so there's not like uh, there's not like a, a direct like super correlation without like going like crazy deep into things that probably don't mean very much. Mm-hmm. Um, on a sad note. Uh, people are now using VR to um, uh, bring up um, images of their uh, um, beloved passed away ones. So yeah, uh, maybe that's what she's doing on Valentine's Day. Maybe uh, and that's just that's just sad. That's just I mean, like not sad as in like oh boohoo, like 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 um, I didn't come out right. Not sad as in like making fun of something. Sad as in like oh that is sad. Ah. Oh. <laughs> but but maybe she's not maybe she's not remembering somebody who's no longer there. Maybe she's connecting with somebody over a, a great distance, you know. And this is how they're staying in touch, touch on Valentine's Day, kind of like how CDPR is staying in touch with all of us. We 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 don't really see them very often. They they you know it's been a been a couple months since they really came out last time, and 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 the time that they were going to come out just got canceled, and their flight got delayed for a couple months, you know, from from april to you know september and they're really sad about it so they're they're giving us the um you know they're giving us the the good feels from a distance maybe that's what's going on here um which which is which is a lot better than than imagining that somebody's like no i can't be with this person anymore only digitally so um yeah so that's 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 kind of what it rolls around to you know what's really really kind of creepy if you go to I believe the URL is thispersondoesnotexist.com and it shows you a photograph that is of a person that looks absolutely real but the person does not exist. It is it, it is a computer generated image and it's different every time. Like every time mm-hmm. you reload the page it's different. Uh, created by a neural network. <clears throat> With a full, what, full on background. It, what you don't know it's is that <laughs> is that all of those people do exist. And it's the neural network who's trying to like make sure that we remember them because they're the people who are disappeared by various organizations and men in black. Oh and, boy. Yeah. I, so I smell a movie you never, idea. You never know. Yeah. It's it's it's, it's, a, it's not a bad idea, is it? Because <laughs> think about it from this narrative standpoint. You're, you're surfing this thing, you go there routinely, and then one day you go there and it's your picture. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> and then you start calling people to be like, dude, man, you got to check this picture out on this website. And they're like, I don't know who you are. Who are you? And you're like, nah, huh, so stop yeah. being funny. It's really like, funny, I, mom. I, yeah. <laughs> I seriously don't remember this number. Um, you know the, w- w- what's going on, and then you start like fading, and you're like, "No, <laughs> yeah." What, like uh, Back to the Future style? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think I think this is a brilliant idea for for a movie. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting this on my long list of things to, to copyright write about. triple S league. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, time being with the hot take in the chat, I draw this conclusion: staples in the face hurt. I would agree. By the way, happy birthday. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, time being just. Revealed in the ch- I'm not doxing her. She she put in the chat that it's her birthday. Happy birthday. Uh, however old you are, we will not ask for your age. But uh, one of our oh. regulars. 
Uh, Alan, I mean, I forgot. I forgot to mention. Um, if you read the latest chapter, um, you'll get a nice little birthday present in there. Something, something that you've been waiting for for a long time. So you know. Yeah. Ali Mafuz says, points out uh, EA is shutting down another studio. Yes, um, the, yeah. the Ghost uh, Gawker. The, yeah, the studio that's been responsible for the Need for Speed games. Mm-hmm. Now, um, the, the headline I read said that it was going to become like a. Like it, what did it say now? So like, I don't think they're actually closing the building. It's going to remain as some kind of a, a engineering or something. But uh, yeah, the, stu- the ge- as a game studio, it seems to be shutting down. So yes, EA, keep on EAing. Um, yes, uh, Metro Exodus, as Notional points out, Metro Exodus is on Steam now. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can check it out on Steam. If you were waiting. The year-long wait is up. And uh, Notional points out points that out in uh, in response to the fact that we will be talking about Tim Sweeney today. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said some very, very interesting things. Before we get into that, though, um, a couple of games were pointed out to us by our community on uh, Discord. Join the Discord community. Click the link in the description below. Lots of great conversations happening there. Uh, so there's a couple of games that... Uh, uh, some of our members have pointed out recently. One is Ghost Runner, and uh, this also answers another question about, you know, what are some other cyberpunk kind of, what are some things in the cyberpunk genre that can keep us going until Cyberpunk 2077 comes out in September? Uh, one is uh, Altered Carbon uh, Season Two is going to mm-hmm. be it's going to be releasing soon. I'm excited for that one because. Um... Yeah, they, they've, uh, they've, from what I've heard, they've done a really good job on it. So, um, I haven't looked into it too much, but the rumor in our in our Discord server is that it's based on it's based more on the uh, the original source material than on mm-hmm. than the first season was. Yeah, I've heard that they're going back to like the book um, a little bit a little bit more in that one, and that it comes out a little bit better. They kind of took some liberties with the first one and. Because, you know, they had to, like, spice it up for TV and whatnot, so. Right, I am just, uh, I'm just looking up. Has it already released? No. Can't have it. Okay, yes, website. I accept your stupid uh, cookies policy. Mm-hmm. I'm looking for a release date for it. Maybe someone in chat can let us know. Um, it's coming out at the end of the month. Sorry. Sorry. No, oh, okay. The, cool. At, at least that's what... That's what I last heard. So, so uh, anyway, there's a game called Ghost Runner that's coming, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, it looks like a mix. It looks like a cyberpunk themed uh, Dishonored slash Mirror's Edge type game, which really yeah, I was I was gonna say Mirror's Edge for sure. Uh, yeah, it's it's from One More Level and 3D Realms, and it uh, I don't know I had I had not heard about this one, so I appreciate uh, someone in the in our uh, Discord pointing it out because it we, looks really cool. We, we could, a few uh, a few months ago ghost runner i think yeah. what uh we, we talked about it we we i don't know i don't know if you saw very much of it but yeah we, we did talk about it it's uh it's one of these interesting like um there's not a whole lot to the game uh other than basically what was said it's it's like mirror's edge and you're running and you're running a, a course and you're um there's like some time slow stuff and and some other cool things in the game it's kind of interesting um but that's the the main thing is is that you're running and you're running and you're running and you're running running. (laughs) i love that stuff i love i love those fast-paced first person especially with the combat it looks like it's got some dishonored style combat i don't know if it'll be as involved as uh, as Dishonored 2 was, but uh, I'm definitely definitely going to be keeping my eye on that one. It mm-hmm. looks really interesting. And then another... It's, it's entirely, it's enti- sadly, it's entirely first person, uh, so... I yeah. Will not start taking Which I love. I know that then, you know, that, that limits your ability to play it, but um, yeah, personally, I love those kinds of things. And then uh, another... Now, I know we've talked about this studio before, 
but we've just recently learned the name of the game that they're working on, or at least the working title, they've said, is The Wayward Realms, and this is from Once Lost Games. Now, when I saw this, I, I was like, this seemed, this website looks so familiar, and then I remembered we had covered this on the pod, we had covered the studio on the podcast, mm-hmm. because this, the studio is run by, uh, basically a whole bunch of people who are former Elder Scrolls developers. Yeah. Including Julian Lefay, who is uh, known known affectionately by fans as the father of the Elder Scrolls. It's got Ted Peterson, who was one of the original designers um, for you know Elder Scrolls Arena, Daggerfall, Morrowind, and Oblivion. It's got VJ uh, Lakshman, who was a lead design and producer on Elder Scrolls Arena, and has worked on a whole ton of other games as well. Uh, and is a uh, you know a published uh, fantasy novel writer. Some other people as well, but yeah. So this the game they're working on. The working title is The Wayward Realms. There's very sparse information available about it. The they have a website a URL. You know they actually have a website up now, although it is uh, it's under construction and there's really no information. Just the logo. Mm-hmm. For the game and then it says something wayward this way comes and then currently under construction check back soon so this was probably a ways off but it's really I, interesting to get sort of a yeah. glimpse of what they're working on I, so i've been doing some digging um they they do have it's, it's very promising I'm, I'm not saying that it's not um and it is very interesting what they're what it looks like they're where they're headed with this. Um, and they are using a lot of that technology or looking to use a lot of that technology that I've talked about, you know, a significantly number of times, how we have, um, you know, games, game world, and, and this whole thing where basically it's like they're looking to, um, <clears throat> they're looking to incorporate an AI that can give you the feel and the sense of a, of a constant evolving uh, GM who's constantly giving you um, new stories, new stuff, new missions, new anything and everything to just kind of like, you know, to really open up your your storytelling so that it's not it's not a singular it's not a singular thing, right? It's it's a a singular storyline where you play through once or twice, you know, and that's it. Um, they they wanted to have it so that the, the story is being created for you on the fly, your responses, and then the story shifts according to your play style. Um, we've gone into depth on this this technology for quite a while, um, and it's not a lot of it's not new new tech. There is some new like aspects of it as far as like uh, neural networks goes. Um, you experimented with the, the with the one story machine. And it kept on spitting out, um, kept on spitting out, uh, uh, Erog. <laughs> so, oh yeah, yeah, we were, <laughs> um, talked to Transformer. I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was playing with that uh, neural network to see how it would complete certain story situations. And yeah, that the amount, the number of times it started spinning off into like erotic fan fiction, mm-hmm. <laughs> it was was quite amusing. Um, tells you what people so, are writing out there. Well, yeah, it, it, yeah, it goes to show what what people are <laughs> reading and watching out there. Um, so that's very interesting. Uh, the concepts behind it. Uh, they're also wanting to use that in systems that are like. <clears throat> so there was a system that was, again, this is this. I've talked about this one a lot before. This was used. It was going to be used in the new um, EverQuest game. Um, and it was the uh, story bricks. Story bricks builds AI function functioning um, characteristics by giving them a, a ton of bricks. Uh, so they, you know, they have a character from a village, and he wants gold. Um, he does not have gold, so he wants to find a way to get gold. Well, there's a zombie who has gold, but also wants to eat brains, and you know, this little villager has brains. So there's this 
you know, it's not just a, a flea mechanic or a fight mechanic. It's like the, the computer's constantly making the NPCs try to figure out how best to get what they want um, without dying, basically. And so you have this living, breathing, interesting world where NPCs actually have things. And, and it's not it's not like you don't have to script it in. Like, in order for you to fill a city full of, like, NPCs, that's a lot of scripting. A ton of scripting. You know, um, just to have an NPC have a daily schedule. Like, like they get up in the morning, they go out, they work for, like, a while, then they head to the inn, um, they grab some food throughout the day, um, and then they go home and they sleep. That is actually very script-heavy. And it's why most NPCs in most games walk from point A to point B, fade in and out of existence, and that's it. Which is really a horrible existence for for your your um, your characters within a video game, and and if you want to know why there's going to be a future revolt when when the AIs take over, um, that that's why that's why that's, that's that's one of the many many reasons that and, and people kicking their their toasters, um, <clears throat> but giving them instead the story brick concept allows the the. Um, allows the AIs to kind of like script themselves. So you give them these really basic scripts and from that you get behavior that's very, very interesting. Hmm. Very smart, very intelligent. And this, this, and again, I'm not kidding, this technology was improved upon greatly, bought out by, um, at the time, Sony, then sold to a Russian hard asset firm and is now in a vault somewhere. So they're now working on new versions of this, and we're going to start seeing some of this stuff in some of these new games coming up over the next few years. It's very interesting because there's a lot of games that um, you know that we've been keeping our eye on that that are approaching this. Uh, we also have some big players that are that are supposedly going to be doing stuff that's similar to this. We keep hearing some very very interesting rumors. Um, and concepts coming out about the new Halo game. So where that ultimately ends up, we don't we don't know for sure, but it's it, you know it's possibly coming. So yeah, yeah, we'll keep our eye on it for sure. Yeah, and so you're saying this Wayward Wayward Realms game is wor is working with some new tech like this? Yeah, they're they're wanting to pursue this kind of stuff. They they don't want to have. Um, they don't want your game experiences to be consumed by stuff that has been pre-written. They want the game instead to create content for you on the fly. And that technology has finally gotten to the point where they think that this is capable and possible. Because up until now, it's always been, you know, write the content, you know, that's it. And these creators, you know, they created these early Elder Scrolls worlds where they had, they did have some technology like, like this when it came to like map making and stuff where i mean in one of the first elder scrolls game you had a map that had like fifty thousand homes in it buildings daggerfall but... was insanely huge yeah yeah. It, yeah it was unbelievable now it was there were limitations to it i mean yeah you started seeing repeated things uh you know as yeah. you're going through and then some really weird artifacts when you're going through dungeons because like there's just so many dungeons, a lot of them were procedurally generated, mm -hmm. um, and you know you'd, you'd start to notice common building blocks, but still being you know rearranged. It was still like for the time it was very impressive, um, yeah. but then occasionally you'd get like a staircase that stretched up at a like ridiculously high angle. Mm -hmm. um, and these guys, these these developers who worked on that stuff, they worked on that stuff because that was groundbreaking at the time. And it still is in a lot of ways, because you still don't have that prevalent in a lot of games. You have a little bit of like the the, the building scope that's a, a that's available in some games. You know, you get uh, No Man's Sky and Minecraft, and a couple other ones that can procedurally create worlds. Um, you know, in in seconds, <laughs> but um, overall, it's like we we haven't really seen that. Not in the way that we want to kind of see that. So, yeah, this is interesting. Yeah. Well, with the, with the advent of neural networks and and uh, other next gen tech, gaming over the next few years going to be is going to be really interesting. But yes, I mean, if they incorporate this kind of tech into the wayward realms, 
Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that holds up against traditionally written content. All right. So those are some uh, interesting upcoming games. Let's uh, get into talking about uh, Tim Sweeney and his keynote presentation at the Dice Summit, where he said some very interesting things. We're going to sort of... Um, we're going to go over... Uh, a bunch of what he said. Now, uh, Tim Sweeney, of course, has been an ob has I don't want to say an object of criticism, but we have criticized him a lot in the past for some of the things he has said. So I've gotten into arguments mm -hmm. with him on Twitter. Um, I mean, we, there's a lot to criticize with his approach as far as the Epic Games Store, and we've done that. We're not going to dive too heavily into that, except that there's a few points in this uh, talk that he gave where you could say, Tim, you're not living you're not sort of you're not operating according to these these statements you're putting out you know there's a little bit of hypocrisy going on here but at the same time he did say a number of things especially when he, when it comes to the interaction uh, between politics and gaming he made a lot of statements that i personally agree with quite a lot and uh, so that it's a mixed bag um so we'll uh you know we'll talk about where we agree, where we disagree, uh, you'll be. We'll talk about what he actually said, and you, you're of course free to draw your own conclusions about uh, what he said. But what is kind of objectively messed up about this situation is IGN's reporting on it, and uh, which is, which was at at best incredibly sloppy. At best, at worst, it was downright you know deliberately mis misrepresenting what he was saying uh in in a in an attempt to get clicks but at best it was in just incredibly sloppy rushed reporting because it was just completely completely misrepresented what he what he was actually saying mm -hmm. so no and, and i i completely agree i think this is one of these scenarios where where really, when you get down to it, I don't know what in the world this journalist was thinking um, or how on earth they got around to clearing this, but it was straight up really messed up the way that they just approached this from the get-go. And it's like, you want to know why people don't respect you? This this is one of the main reasons. As much as as much as I'm not a fan of of Tim, as much as I think the the dude is, um, has been a huge problem for gaming, and that his own like hubris r does not allow him to realize his mistakes. At the same time as ha he having valid points, like he he brings up a lot of really valid points in here, but it's hard to focus on those valid points when when I'm looking at the other content that he brings, the other things that he's doing for the industry, and you're going, you're just hurting. Like, seriously, you're just hurting everything. Like, you're causing more damage than you realize, and it's kind of terrible. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Which is why I say it's a mixed bag. Um, I'm, now my, my, in situations like this, my approach is to assess the ideas and try to separate them from the person that's saying the ideas. Um, it's not always the easiest thing to do, but mm -hmm. like I said, he, he does say some things that I think are, um, that make a lot of sense and that, that I agree with, but there's also some, some areas where it's like, did you just say that, that kind of make yourself a hypocrite. So, um, I'll just go through, I'll start going through some of these, um, We'll do, uh, we'll get to the pal the politics one last, but uh, so in talking about um, it, he actually we'll get right into where where he might be kind of uh, cutting off the branch he's sitting on, so to speak, in the, in the sense that he talks about customer adversarial models of of game development in the industry, and he. He says, we have businesses that profit by doing their customers harm. Facebook and mm -hmm. Google have been the leaders in this. They provide free services, then make you pay for their service in loss of privacy and loss of freedom. Uh, but then he says that it's critical that, that game companies move away from these kinds of 
of uh, adversarial models, and he says uh, that mobile developers need to open up for publishers to freely put their products on their marketplace. Sweeney said his company had tested the current system by submitting Fortnite to the Google Play Store. Fortnite was rejected just because it used a different payment method than what was supported. That needs to change, and it will change. I found this one really interesting because he's, he's, he's advocating for open platforms, and yet the Epic Games Store has been uh, a hotbed for exclusives on PC. And we had the whole... Uh, we had the whole issue with um, with Dark, the game that rejected Epic exclusivity, and then um, Sweeney got on Twitter. I'm pretty sure it was Dark. I'm thinking of Sweeney yeah. got on Twitter and 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 sort of tried to spin this as Epic being in support of this, and it it just didn't make sense because it's like, yeah, no, no, we we totally support your ability to be on whatever platform you want to be. We're not we're not trying to force you, right? But it was kind of and it was kind of like, well, people were saying, well, why won't you let it on? If, if, if you're in support of an open marketplace and multiple stores being the future of gaming on PC, why won't you put it on your platform and let it be on Steam and uh, GOG and all these other platforms as well? Like, practice what you preach, man. And uh, But no, like it was either Epic exclusive or, or this game is not on Epic. And there's... But, you know, there's, there's reasons for that. I think it came down to, like, um, the, <laughs> the Epic game. If, if, they're going to, if they're going to invest in this little indie game, uh, they want to make sure they're, they're gaining the profit from that. And uh, it's... Okay, just admit that. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, don't try to... Don't, don't, don't try to sugarcoat it as if... You're trying to like just admit you're trying to be, just admit what's actually going on. You're 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 nailing down these exclusives to build your store. Don't pretend you're you're just doing this as some benevolent act to improve the gaming industry. You know, it's just kind of didn't make sense at all. But so I thought this was a little bit hypocritical. What do you think? Yeah, and this is this is where like most of what he said was was pretty spot on. The fact that Facebook and Google have caused so much harm, 100%. The fact that there's there's games on Google's platforms that are designed and aimed specifically at children that have just some of the worst gambling mechanics you can find with utilizing years, decades of high-intensity inten high research on figuring out how to make these people spend the most money that they can um, and retain the most amount of users and get those people to spend as much money as possible. And we're not even talking about a good product. We're talking about a cookie cutter, you know, game from one game to the next. It's the same thing. It's the same stupid mechanics. It's the same stupid gameplay that has been there, you know, since the store launched. It's like the same stuff, and it's just been like garbage, like copy pasted now. For I mean, like ninety percent of these these games on these platforms are get a team of five people, and then you can use a team of five people to do arena and battlegrounds and 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 dungeon content where they take turns doing their mechanics, or it's you know it's some version of that, and these were crap games started you know because they're easy to they're ri ridiculously easy to code um they're really easy for like repetitive content you just get the same garbage over and over and over and over and over again and that's it that's the extent of the 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 content and yet some of these games um you know I'm not as annoyed with Raid Shadow Legends as I am with other games because Raid Shadow Legends, at least, at least they have the balls to uh, directly sponsor content creators that are, you know, that are that are off the list as far as Google's concerned. You know, you got MXR amongst many others who Google's said no for whatever reason they hate this person for whatever reason they're they've 
they've gone out of their way. Somebody at the company has gone out of their way to make their lives a living hell. And, and yet somehow raid manages to show the balls to actually like show up. And, and so I, I'm not as annoyed with raid as I am with basically every other game out there. However, they just launched a battle pass on top of a subscription service on top of daily sales and deals that equal in excess of $200 a day. At this point, I'm getting a little like really angry at them. Um, at least they don't market this stuff to like 10 year olds, like another game company does, like another studio does with, with children's products that we're going to get into here in, in a couple days. Um, at least they don't do that. At least they're like kind of aiming it at like adults and saying, yeah, this, this is more of an adulty type game, which it is. They've got some like, you know, characters in it that are kind of, you know, whatever. And so again, I, not, not necess not a fan and getting increasingly more annoyed at them. But overall, it's like, this is just the content that, that these app stores have. And there's nothing new here you know most of them are are the gameplay is like sure some of the gameplay is ingenious like some like flappy bird ingenious at its time right when it first came out pretty genius i gotta say yeah, that's pretty smart even though it just boils down to a click right it boils down to a single click and there's other things where it's like they, they're really coming up with some very interesting stuff but these are at best at at the absolute best these are these are like mini game stuff and you have entire entire companies that are being like funded by this like activision with with um the stupid what's it called game it's like <laughs> i don't know is, what it's called uh what? candy crush um oh this yeah, is, yeah this is one of these like this is the only thing saving their behinds right now that and you know a mobile version of of uh caught or whatever it's like this is this is all they have now this is all they've got this is all they've they've managed to to do and it's pathetic and yeah kojima tried the same thing konami sorry konami konami tried the same thing and um it was great for them for a few years but now they've seen their company start to tail off now they're like oh dear i guess we have to get back to making actual games because apparently you know this stuff doesn't uh, last forever. It's like, yeah, no kidding. No kidding, it doesn't last forever. So, really, just overall, um, they deserve this. They deserve this criticism, and, and Tim Sweeney is 100% right. But Tim Sweeney does the exact same thing as far as, like, controlling the market that he's doing here. Now, he says he's trying to do it for the greater good, and it feels like, you know, a little bit of that, con you know, a little bit of his repetition there, and that makes me think of um, uh, Hot Fuzz, right? The greater good, the greater good. It's for the greater good. Um, and it's not. It's just for his pocketbook. So it's okay when he does it in one perspective, but not okay when somebody else does it in a different perspective. So, all right, okay, Tim, we're playing that game now, I guess. So, sure. Um, doesn't make what he's saying less true when it comes to Facebook and, and Google. Because mm. they are they are 100%. Um, and and they, they know it. Because you can often say this. What, what do all of the leaders and executives of Facebook and Google have in common? And it's that none of their kids are using their platforms. None of their kids are using their their the things that they as as adults create. That's when you know there's a problem. It's like um, it's like there's an investigation into like I can't remember what it was long time ago. I think it was in the like sixties, but it's like I think it was like tobacco or something like that. But whatever it was, it was like some reporter did some investigating and found out that, that none of the kids of these companies were using the product that their parents created. And one of them asked them straight out and the kid responded like, like, Oh yeah, dad says that this stuff is like lethal not to touch it, never to use it because it's like extremely dangerous. And it's like, turns out, Oh yeah, yeah, that was right. And they knew it the whole time. 
you know, and, and that's, that's kind of what, what happened. I mean, it's, it's messed up and I can't, I can't remember what, where exactly that, that was from. It was a long time ago, but the, the concept is the same in that none of these people at Google allow their kids to use the products there because they know what is being targeted to their kids and they know exactly what's going on. And that's the last thing they want their kids to, to touch because it is very, very dangerous and they understand it and they're not willing to, um, you know, they're not, they're not willing to, to get their kids involved in that kind of stuff. And this is where we, we've got to like raise the flag and say, um, hello, major problem here. Does nobody else see what's going on? Does nobody else see what we're putting down? Like, this is seriously not good. And the reaction has been really lackluster in in just, you know, people calling this stuff out. Mm -hmm. So. Right. Well, on a related note, Sweeney went on to criticize pay-to-win mechanics and games and loot box business models, which, I mean, it's Bo's that Fortnite doesn't technically have loot boxes anymore, but um, they, it certainly used to, at least in the um, in the PvE version. Or actually, does it still have the llamas you can buy? It's been forever since I've been in that game. But uh, I believe they've changed it. I, I remember reporting on on some way that they had changed the system. But... Yeah, now now it's it's still essentially the same system. You just get to see what your first flip is going to be. And so you can make the decision on whether or not you, you want to spend it. Now, they still have similar spending practices because people, they don't buy just one pack. They buy like 50 of them. And because they're hedging their bet that out of the 50 that they're buying, that one of them is going to contain something that they want. So, yeah, of course they're not going to base their purchases based off of the first flip that they see unless that first flip is actually something really awesome. But in regards of like this stuff... It's like on an average, you want to flip like, you know, it's like seven, eight hundred packs a year. And if you just naturally let the, the machine give you that sneak peek, you're only buying 365 of them. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so really, it's like, it seems like. He, he, he takes these things he's criticizing, but in, in his case, he does them slightly different, so that makes it okay. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I remember covering that uh, when when they changed the Fortnite model of how it was working, and it was like, well, this isn't really that much better. But anyway, yeah. he makes a statement that, I mean, I, I agree with the statement, hypocrisy aside. He says, we have to ask ourselves as an industry what we want to be when we grow up. Do we want to be like Las Vegas with slot machines or do we want to be widely respected as creators of products that customers can trust? I think we will see more and more publishers move away from loot boxes. I mean, I agree with the, the point he's trying to make there. And that, yeah. I mean, uh, the loot box thing has led to a massive distrust, massive reputational harm for the games industry it's getting governments involved people are probably hearing about loot boxes who wouldn't even know what they are because it's being covered in mainstream media because it's such a big issue yeah he goes on to say we should be very reticent of creating an experience where the outcome can be influenced by spending money loot boxes play on all the mechanics of gambling except for the ability to get more money out in the end which is which is highly shocking um, it's shocking. And, and I, I, and I realized that, like, I realized early on that this was a massive problem because there were fake casinos that you could play at on these gambling games on, on these app games. You play at these fake casinos where you could play like, you know, Texas Hold'em or other games or, or roulette or whatever. You could play these games and it was, you know, it was awesome. You know, you, you, you could you could play and you could win the jackpots you could i mean there's just there's just there there were slot machine versions of this stuff and you're like okay um but you don't actually get real money out of this no no you don't get real money out of this it's like okay uh it's wait can you buy these chips with real world money well yeah of course it's just like a real gambling experience except you don't win anything 
Yeah, you win you win in-game money. What do you use with that in-game money? You get to gamble again. It's like so there is no out. Like I can't tell you how many like how many like casino operators have been have been wishing for this system where like you walk <laughs> in, you spend money, doesn't matter what you do, what you win, you can't take you the just, money out again. You just You can't take the money out again. Yeah. Like I can't like this is this is seriously like and the the sad thing is, is that I know people that have like gone for this lock stock and barrel like just just like off the deep end like worked with this one dude who was like it's like yeah I love this I love this stuff I get to like you know I get I you know I won a jackpot last night playing poker it's like oh cool what how much you win he's like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and was like wow congratulations so are you quitting your job or like like was like are you gonna go on a vacation he's like no no, no it was in the game it's like, oh you were at a fake casino online using mo- how much money did you spend to get you know to win that jackpot it's like two grand you spent two grand of your real dude i can seriously you want to gamble take two grand to the local casino put it on black for one roll, there you go. At least you, you got a you got a fifty or for, sorry forty nine point uh, was it forty nine point five or whatever chance that you're gonna double your money. At least that's better than putting dropping two grand on a fake casino where you don't get anything out of it. And the it's like yeah. so yeah no I I agree with Tim here because this is this is true this is this is garbage this is bunk but he's a little bit. He's a little, he's a, he's a little bit of the pot calling the kettle black because, you know, Fortnite was fueled off of this microtransaction system that he hasn't changed until now. So, right. Well, a little while ago, so then, you know, he changed it about a year ago. Congratulations, Tim. You 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 found that you had a little bit of a spine. Um, now he's getting up. He's saying this stuff. If he stops. You know, with the whole like um, exclusive thing on his thing, and if he if he releases these games to be you know to go onto Steam and to go onto whatever plat- platform they want, then sure, uh, great. If he includes uh, some <clears throat> some adult titles to go up on the on the Epic platform, you know, I'll start to like give him some space. But for the moment, he keeps saying this stuff. He keeps saying that he's walking the walk, but he's not actually walking the walk. He's he's as fake as he's always been. And that's the thing that, that really irks me in this, is that, no, Tim, no, you're not some bastion of this, because you looked at, at Steam, where they're getting Subverse and they're getting these other games, and you openly mock them for being nothing but, you know, nothing but a porn game. You know, nothing but a, a, um, a studio or a platform that allows prawns on the game or on their on their platform, and it's like, no, they 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 said free speech, absolutists. We have to do this because if we if we start drawing the line, then we we become the arbiters of what what is okay for everybody to consume, and we think that the customer should have that right, and. You know, for the most part, <clears throat> you know, for the most part, and I didn't always agree with this. When I was younger, I was very much against this this line of thinking, and it it didn't, and it took to the point where I realized that if you stifle one speech, you have to stifle stifle other speeches, and before you know it, somebody's getting shut down, and I realized, oh, that's not good, because ultimately, you have to let competition be there, otherwise, you you're 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 sitting on a system that's ready to fail. Right. It's like um, it's like the, the, there's an anime that's out right now. Everybody's talking about it. I won't go too much into it, but it's it's a it's a very spicy anime. In fact, I don't even know why it's called anime. It should be called um, the other title that that stuff gets put under. Um, but it's very spicy. So what did a bunch of people decide to do? They decided to shut it down, to close it out, to boycott the thing and to get everybody else that they knew to boycott the thing well now it's in like the number one spot worldwide for anime so congratulations you took an anime that was kind of like a haha hey look at that that's 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 really funny and twisted um 
gee, somebody somebody needs to get out a little bit more, or isn't you know the 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 only good last doctor that we had put it, get a boyfriend or get a girlfriend. It's like it's like just like like seriously, get get out, go meet people. Like if this is your you know if this is your primary like source of entertainment, you, you need to get out a little bit. And and instead they took it from this, which would have been just like shrugged off as kind of like well you know. <laughs> Yeah, we we all know where this is going, and then people would have walked away from it. It went from that to now it's one of the number one, um, it's it's like the number one anime of the year. The other respect to this, which Polly's brought up, Polly Polly's in the chat nine one one. Good good job on this one. Subverse is is a great example of this because what we're about to see with that, and as you know, we're we've interviewed them. We're close enough to the project to to know what's going on. Um, we we haven't seen any solid gameplay yet, but it's he, everything that I'm hearing. It's coming along great. In fact, more than great, it's coming along amazingly well. Is this going to be the new Mass Effect? No, no, it won't. But it might be the prelude to one. They they might make this one have such amazing, astounding success. Look at it and go, okay, we can make this even better. We can offer more choice, more flexibility, more storytelling, attract some like really good writers, and we might actually be able to come up with a, a yeah, yeah, let's let's do this. And that's the thought. That's that's the realization that they're they're under. And that's where I've been saying that this is coming out for a while now. I honestly believe that you know EA and other people have messed up so much that all they've done is opened a door to basically being able to have this stuff become the new mainstream. And what you end up getting from that is something that the big corporations aren't willing to touch. And they'll end up having caused their own extinction by trying to control the market too much. And this is what we're seeing here. And this this is going to bleed into the last story of the day, which we're not going to get into right now, but we're getting around to it, that governments are starting to tax digital in-game currencies starting to not not is not completely but they're starting to but trust me i'm going to walk you through the process and and we'll we'll see how it goes so yeah no tim tim is right on this um and he's kind of like but he's he's so hypocritical and he's so fake when it comes to a lot of this stuff and he's caused legitimate damage. It's the fact that he doesn't realize the damage that he's caused. There are developers who had games that were highly anticipated. Now they're not. You know, he he's had games that have gone through their release, put out the game, and the game has never once hit more than a thousand concurrent users. That's a failure. That's a failure that 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 these developers are choking on right now. There's one developer who says, "Look." We made a horrible mistake. We went from having like, you know, 5,000, 8,000 people that were, were behind our game, where were waiting there, willing to show up. They were on our forums every single day, you know, upvoting everything, being really positive, talking about the game. It went from that to um, down to about 200 people. And the rest of those people who used to be on our side, they now come and mock us every single day. They, 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 swear off the game they've done nothing but created bad person to person uh uh reviews for it and they have done nothing but trash our game send us you know horrible letters don't do that it doesn't it doesn't help but like they've got nothing but they've got nothing but crap out of this and tim looks at that and says yeah that's how you play the game man and he walked away. There, there are whole studios now that are having to rebrand completely for the next game release because everybody has them on a blacklist right now of people that they will not support going forward. So, yeah, good, good job there, Tim. Good job on realizing that that's what you've done and going out of your way to fix it. It's like he hasn't, and that's that's the stupidity of it. So. Mm-hmm. All right, and then let's get on to the the issue that was the subject of the the blatantly false reporting. Um, 
So, at the end of his presentation, Sweeney talked about uh, gaming discourse and politics and says, we should get the marketing departments out of politics. We live in a world where your political affiliation determines what chicken restaurant you go to. There's no reason to drag divisive topics like that into gaming. Um, employees, customers, and everyone else should be able to express themselves. We as companies need to divorce ourselves from politics. Platforms should be neutral. So he uh, he's basically... Um, yeah, so he's making the point about wanting not wanting um, game companies to capitalize on on political division. And uh, basically, IGN, IGN published a headline based on this saying, Epic Games boss says all politics should be removed from games. Okay. I see where they. I see where they. Where they. Um, you know, totally were able to understand that there was a complete and total uh, direct correlation between those two things. It was. It was ridiculous. I mean, they, and then they after they caught a lot of flack for this, they went and changed their headline to say, "Epic Games boss says all politics should be removed from game companies," which is still not what he said. Um. But at least it's a little closer. They also changed, you know, they, they changed some wording within the article. They didn't identify where the, uh, you know, where they made the changes. They did put an update on the article, but all the update says is that Tim Sweeney has responded to the story in a tweet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they didn't actually, and th this is the problem with a, a lot of these uh news quote-unquote news websites now they'll, they'll put out something completely wrong they'll either you know report too quickly on it or they'll just be completely irresponsible in what they report and then when they catch flack for it they go back and change it but they don't mark that they've changed it they don't mark what's been changed and you know so the it's harder to keep them accountable, although you know you can access you can access archived versions of the web pages in many cases. But they get so many clicks from their initial false reporting that the you know they just kind of shrug and walk away from it, like whatever. And then very few people will see the correction, and th this happens in in all of journalism these days, uh, which is it's just disgusting. But it's yeah gaming journalism is is no uh is definitely not immune to this kind of a thing anyway mm -hmm. tim sweeney um did respond to the article and he said here's one of the key views i shared at dice if a game tackles politics as to kill a mockingbird did as a novel it should come from the heart of creatives and not from marketing departments seeking to capitalize on division and he did use that i didn't quote it earlier but he did talk about that in his uh in his keynote speech <clears throat> he was not at all saying there should not be politics or political themes or anything in games he was saying that these shouldn't be th the it shouldn't be the marketing departments that are using politics to try and sell things you know, it shouldn't be the corporate side of things trying to take a side on a social issue or a political issue uh, in order to try and capitalize on, you know, in order to sell things. Um, he said this creates division. But and we, we, I think he says very well here something that we've talked about a lot before. Yes, I mean, a lot of the best games out there, uh, they do address uh, political themes. I think... I think about uh, the original Deus Ex had some very interesting, um, some very interesting themes regarding you know this future dystopia and different choices you had to make and 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 what are you know which faction are you going to support which factions mm -hmm. and it made you weigh the pros and cons and the, the different perspectives. It was a fascinating game. That's one of the games that has made me sit back and think more than more than most and i think that's the best like i love that when when a video game actually makes you think makes you consider makes you come up you know assess the 
the facts and data you have, think critically about it, assess the pros and cons, and th really think through an issue that, yes, is taking place in a fictional world, but has definite applications to real life, especially, you know, uh, you know, I think cyberpunk is going to do this, you know, especially we're living in a world that is looking more and more like the cyberpunk vision that Mike Pondsmith had back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. So cyberpunk 2077 is probably going to do this. I'm anticipating there's going to be a lot of points in that game where you sit back and think, I don't know what the right thing to do here is. I'm going to really have to think about it. Um, and that is politics in games done right, in my opinion. And that's kind of what, what Sweeney is saying here. When it comes from the heart of the artist, uh, the, the storytellers, the people creating these things, uh, that is, you know, that that's where it's done right. When it's the marketing department saying, no, we want you to push this perspective that's where it's being done wrong, and that's where we're seeing uh, the division and criticism. And mm -hmm. uh, that's that's what the the people don't. That's what gamers don't like. And then well, and, and, and then the media and comes along and says, "Oh, gamers are these backwards, you know, degenerates." Because they don't. Well, wanna... it's it's kind of a self self fulfilling prophecy, as you had with like the 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 rock and roll, you know, music of the the sixties and. It's like, yeah, well, this is this is what you get when you try to push something away so hard. Um, you end up creating, like, the very thing for it, and you rely on, you know, outrage. And Paulie's points this out. Thanks, thank you for the super chat. Um, you know, IGN has gone woke, as some people say, and Tim attacks their, their basic ideology. And this is, this is kind of, this is really true, and what you end up having is like if you would if you were to give um you know these people con absolute control over the entire industry they do a cleansing they do a uh they'd set up you know thought police they do all this other stuff and you'd only end up making that thing that you're trying to crush more popular and ultimately end up mainstreaming it you know, like you, you know, and again, I'm going to go back to the whole Japan thing. Japan tried to crush something and all they've ended up doing after 50 years is they created the very thing as the main, as a, as a cornerstone of their entire market. Um, it's like 8% of their entire GDP is something that 50 years ago, a bunch of, um, Puritans tried to, uh, make impossible to to have in their society. So a bunch of Puritans 50 years ago were like, we must erase this from the face of the planet. And we're definitely going to erase it from the minds and hearts of all of our people. And we're going to, we're going to do it by force. Well, congratulations, now 8% of your GDP is that, that very thing. It's the same thing with alcohol. It's the same thing with um, with a lot of other vices. It's like, the minute that you try to control it absolutely and totally um, is where you where you end up creating an entire culture around it. And you can do it. You can you can stuff it down, but you have to do it um, you know appropriately, like like some European countries do with uh, drinking and driving. You know they they do it in such a way that it it makes a little bit more sense. And but it's not it's not. Um, it, 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 the the approach is completely different. It's like, yeah, we understand, but let's be responsible, you know. And and that's that's the the tagline instead of like, you will bend the knee and we will control everything that you do, which never works. It never works. And I have I bring this up so often, it never works. What e IGN is is arguing for here and what they're creating and what they're trying to do to like on the sly never works it just doesn't you're idiots if you think that it's going to result in anything other than an absolute breakdown of what you're trying to have happen it just doesn't it just doesn't work that way and you know and ultimately you end up and and this goes the same you know this this goes the same for anything like you know the you know um any kind of any time that you're like especially when it's hypocritical stuff 
like even more so in that, you know, and, and we've seen this throughout human history. It's like anytime an organization or an ideology gets too much weight behind it, starts to try and force down everything else that it doesn't like, those things end up becoming pre prevalent. And it's, it's kind of like, um, the church tried to force down, uh, this, this is, this is kind of a funny thing. This, this isn't going to get too political. The church tried to force down stockings for a really long time because stockings were like this, like, um, thing that prostitutes did. And it just ended up making it mainstream, like 150 years later to the point where they actually, it's actually part of the clothing. Like, uh, you actually have to have it now. In, in certain aspects of this. And so th this is the funny thing is because it's like, it's like, it's cyclical. I think that's the correct term where it's just, it just goes in a circle and you're on one side of the circle or you're on the other side of this. You're looking at the other side of the circle and you're like, those dastardly bastards, we got to force them away. And you chase them to the point where you switch sides. That's this circular. It just goes, it, no matter what you do, you're you're constantly just chasing people from one side of the circle to the other, and it it's not how it works. Well, yeah, and there's and a lot. So... There, there, there's when when you look at the nature of you know why people believe what they do, and how to convince people other like you will never. I mean, there's there's two ways to try and can change somebody's mind about something. One is to only expose them to the view you want them to believe and then eliminate every other view, which is, you know, uh, a lot of work, first of all. You mm -hmm. need a huge bureaucracy in place. I mean, it, it can happen. I mean, it happens in, I mean, just look at North Korea right now. Um, so you can control all the media. You can control all, you know, the entire uh, source of information that people are exposed to. And then they only believe one thing, except they're not truly convinced. Mm -hmm. They might say they believe in something, but, you know, because that's all they've been told. But some of them are, some of them are undoubtedly saying, this sounds like, this sounds stupid and crazy. And I think the truth is different, but they may not speak up for fear of punishment. But um, anyway, you haven't truly convinced them. And as soon as they are exposed to a rational argument for the opposing view guess what? Their mind is completely changed. Um, so that's one way is, is gaslighting and completely trying to just control what people are exposed to. Uh, the other way is to uh, engage in a human connection and, uh, you know, respectfully discuss a point of view. I guess, you know, a third way is just, you know, arguing and yelling, which rarely gets anywhere. Uh, but, you know, actually... I don't know what we're yelling about! Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually engaging with somebody and questioning their assumptions while, you know, showing respect for them as a person, you're way more likely to actually convince them of something and, and have it really be an actual change of mind because they've thought through it. Mm -hmm. So what, yeah, this idea that we need to push a certain point of view in games is ridiculous. no craft a story that makes people think about these issues and if you if you do a good job they'll come around to your to your way of thinking or they might not i mean there's no i mean human beings are incredibly varied and you know there's there's a whole bunch of things that play into what we believe obviously but um you know you'll you're far more likely to convince somebody of your point of view if you let them arrive at that conclusion on their own mm -hmm. so there you go. Anyway, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I definitely agree with what he's saying here about, you know, game companies should kind of be politics agnostic. I mean, yeah, let the political themes come through in their game in your games, but you know, have it come from the Is heart it, of the creatives. It's also why um, I'm gonna get um, theoretical here. If you want to make good if, if you want to make good products, if you want to stay on top of your field in whatever company you're running, you need people who think differently. If everybody thinks the exact same way, that is ultimately going to boil down to the way that they approach everything. Some of the best comedy writing in history 
has been from two people who respect each other but have very different views almost like black and white to each other um i talk about him every once in a while but jack benny is a is a legendarily like groundbreaking i mean he 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 broke ground in vaudeville before radio and tv then he got into radio when it became a thing he broke ground there then when tv became a thing he became a leader in television he also became a leader in movies too this is this is one of the greatest entertainment minds that we have ever seen ever he broke ground as far as like racism at the time he he had uh, he really pushed things he had um two writers who these guys would never ever be friends ever like the, at the time it was like it was at the time you know it was it was a lot more volatile and and far more like you know uh, racially charged back in those days but he basically looked at um, these two writers he got them to work together and these these were two guys who would never you know they, they don't see eye to eye on much and those were his two main writers for the entirety of his of his like radio and tv and movie career and one of the greatest comedic du duos in history and they did it because they had two very different ways of looking at stuff. One was uh, like classical Republican. One was classical Democrat. Uh, one one had very like, you know, uh, what most people would call right center views, and the other and the other one had very left center views. And they managed to create some of the greatest comedy ever. You need this concept of like being able to see differences in order to make products that are good. Um, you don't have to do that, but it certainly does help because when one person can see something else that the other person doesn't see, you're going to end up getting the best of both worlds. And it's just generally healthy to have people who have different opinions around you so that you can sort through the opinions, figure out what works, figure out what doesn't work. Um, and, and this is, this is like, this is why universities were used to be all about free speech is because it's like, you want to hear the good ideas. You also want to hear the bad ideas so that people understand the difference between a good idea and a bad idea. Like you, you actually need to understand that. That's that's the whole concept behind free speech is you hear out the bad ideas so that you can go, no, that's a bad idea. But you don't have that, you know, these days anymore. And it's kind of, ugh, it's, it's it's kind of scary mm -hmm. in that way because it's not it's not going anywhere. And I know there's a lot of phrasing, and I don't want to get overly po political, but that's just that's just the there's just the, the, the inner concepts that has worked in the past, and if they've worked in the past, then don't mess with them. Like, you know, try try to see outside of of it. And, you know, a good a good lesson is like, you know, um, learn stuff from people who have the opposite ideological view than you do, because you will if you can hear them and if you can if you can really repeat their argument back to them then you understand their position and if you understand their position then you understand your position better if you can't comprehend the strategy behind the guy that you're playing chess with or you know, the girl or whatever if you can't comprehend their strategy you will lose to them you might win but it'll be but it'll be a fluke yeah the, if, it shows the, you really if you can articulate the position that you disagree with it really shows that you have a thorough understanding of the entire mm -hmm. issue. So, all but, right. Yeah. You are listening to the augmented reality podcast. We love seeing everybody so active in the live chat. If you want to keep the conversation going after the live broadcast, uh, please join the discord community. You can find the link in the description below. It's a place where you can chat with us and other triple S community members about all the things we love to talk about and stay up to date about everything we're doing here at the triple S league Give us topics that you want us to talk about, that kind of a thing. Uh, share news and info with other people. Click the link below to join. Be sure to say hi to us in the welcome channel. Polly's 911 thank you so much for the uh, generous super chat. Polly says, you can still make a political game without woke or right-wing politics. Spec Ops The Line is a good example of this, and Ubisoft do it often with Far Cry games. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, that... Uh, 
that is true. Yeah, you can you can get people thinking about issues without pushing a particular point of view. All right. On to our last topic of the day, which is about uh, taxation of in-game currencies. Sounds like a fun topic. Why don't you... Uh, we won't spend too much on this, but uh, yeah. Run us through what's happening there, Cy. So we've got... Um... We've got some governments starting to begin the process of taxing com uh, com um, video game currencies that are buyable, especially if they're tradable or have some kind of facet. So the, the main thing that this is covering right now is that if you buy and sell in-game currencies, you have to pay taxes on it. So if you're if you have a business that revolves around you mass buying and selling or trading of accounts that have v bucks in this particular case then you're going to have to pay tax on it this is the first step in many steps that will ultimately result in in-game currencies that you pay cash for or pay any kind of a currency for to get um, become a taxable source of income or a taxable source of of spending or will have some kind of a tax associated with it at some point because in-game currencies do have the ability to print money for certain people within the industry um there are some game there is that one game where you can actually like you can you you can go into the video game you can farm currency and then you take that money out of the game and you can sell it to sell it back to the company and make money it's not a lot but you could do it and the this is very interesting um this is the beginning of of a digital marketplace um this is actually a this is actually sort of a healthy thing because if governments see that there's enough people making money off of this stuff they want a piece of the pie so this is this is the the first step in one of many that that's going to happen with this. Now, <clears throat> most people look at this story and they go, oh, "Okay, you know that's a nothing burger. I don't care." You know, I I'm not a Chinese gold farmer, so why would I care about this? Well, you should care because this is again the first step to many 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 steps forward going through this in into the future. We are going to see more of this every single day, and it's going to get more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And it, it, it's not going to stop. It's going to keep going until we get to the absolute um, end case, which is the end case is going to be every, every transaction that you're going to have in video games with any kind of like real world currency is going to be, um, is going to have a small tax for the government. Uh, it starts out typically as, and, and again, you can track this stuff. Um, the Brits did it, and that's what led to the revolution, uh, or the war for independence, I should say. Um, every government has done this uh, at some point. They see a source of taxable income, and they say, you know what, uh, for the sake of national interest and national safety, we have to tax just a little bit of this from mainly people selling this stuff outside of the country because we're losing, you know, this valuable resources to other countries and, and we need to make sure that we don't, we kind of keep a control on that so that that way we can spend the money on stuff, you know, inside the country. And, and everybody sits around and listens to that and goes, yeah, that's fair. That's a good idea. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. You know, it doesn't affect me because I'm, I'm not, I'm not buying and selling this stuff. So it just doesn't affect me. Everybody's sitting around going, oh, okay, well, it means less taxes for all of us. All right, cool. So that, that's the first step. Second step, later on down the road, is... So yeah, we've been attack, taxing this stuff for a while, but it turns out people are making like tax havens and, and, and they're trying to find loopholes. And so we're going to get rid of the loopholes on this and we're going to make sure that you are getting the ability to uh, make this stuff yourself. So yeah, that's that's what we're going to do. And everybody's like, oh, okay, all right, this works. So what does this now mean? Well, it just means that we're going to tax anybody who's who's doing anything in this regard and everybody's like mm, okay well i thought we weren't going to do that but again if it doesn't affect me you know well i mean it's affecting more people in the room now but uh, all right whatever and then a couple of years go by and then they say oh you know uh, we're just 
you know, we've been taxing this income for a really long time now. So we've just decided that we're just going to tax all of this because that way then it's just a, it's a, it's a fair, even playing field. And everybody's like, well, I guess it is a, a fair, even playing field. I, I guess, I guess the government has to do this. All right. Well, I guess we're all paying taxes on this now. And that's the process. That's the process. That's what they're doing. It's the start of a long process. It's again, I'm not a conspiratorial person. This is how every form of taxation has ever evolved. Oh, it's only a tax for some people that are not you. No, it's a tax for more people that aren't you. Okay, you know what? It's a tax for everybody. Everybody has to pay this. It's just the way it goes. And they've, I'm, I'm, the only thing that I'm surprised at is that it's taken this long. I would have thought this would have showed up back in like 2004. I really, I would have thought that, that there would have been plans to make this happen as soon as this kind of stuff started to even percolate. The fact that it's taken, you know, 16 years is shocking to me, but not really because, I mean, that's how government bureaucracy is. They're so behind and so inept at running the country that they're completely incapable of doing anything of, of actual real worth. So, yeah. That's that's uh, that's where we boil that down to. I look at it, I laugh hysterically uh, because I can see what's coming and very few other people can. So congratulations, you're on the inside track on this one. Yeah, <sighs> yeah. So okay, and yeah, no taxation is is a uh, is one of the the there's um what is it? There's two original jobs in in human history. Taxation was the second job. The minute that the first job started making money, somebody sat that sat up and went, "Hey, hey, 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 hey! I want, I want a piece of that. I am the government. I am here to take a bit of that." I mean, it's so ingrained that I mean, even animals do it. It's it's kind of funny. It's it's really funny. So, well, not funny like as in har har funny. It's more like like this is absolutely like obviously, obviously this was gonna happen, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. And I think that's about it for today, is it not? Uh, yeah, I think we've covered everything. So thank you so much, everybody, uh, for the great conversation in the chat. Thank you for supporting this show. But uh, whether you're listening live or after the fact, uh, don't forget to slam that like button before you leave. Uh, we really appreciate that. Subscribe to the channel. Leave comments below if you're listening after the fact. All of that stuff really helps our our content to grow and spread and get out there and uh, build the channel we really really uh, appreciate all of that and a special thank you to our patreon supporters and our channel members who helped to make this content possible our big damn heroes over on patreon josh robin and our two anonymous supporters over there thank you so much our channel members jason cropper mr pazernik jer schultz game notes night city punk and terror cake Really appreciate all of you folks. If you're listening after the fact on SoundCloud, iTunes, Spotify, or any of those other platforms uh, that the podcast goes out to, we appreciate your interactions there as well. Don't forget that you can join the live show on Wednesdays and Saturdays where you can interact with us and other listeners and be part of a discussion. See the Discord server for exact times and schedule. The Augmented Reality Podcast is a presentation of the Triple S League. Check out our YouTube channel for game guides, reviews, comedy, news updates, and tons more quality gaming content. My name is Ash. On behalf of Subsidian, thank you all so much for listening. And uh, we'll talk to you again very soon.